Okay, people, listen up. Why don't you all to forget the flight plan? From this moment on, we are improvising a new mission. We'll, Sorry, we'll get somebody to look at that. Got to get the bulb around here. Somewhere. How do we get our people home? They are here. We turn them around, straight back, yes. direct the board. No, oh, no, 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 sir. We get them on a free return trajectory. It's the option with the fewest question marks for safety. I agree with Jerry. Use the moon's gravity, slingshot them around. No, the LEM will not support three guys for that amount of time. It barely holds I mean, we've got to do a direct abort. We do an about face, we bring the guys right home right now. Get them back soon, no, absolutely. We don't even know if the Odyssey's engine's even working, and if there's been serious damage to this spacecraft... They blow up and they die. That is not the oh, argument. We're talking about time, not whether or not these guys... Come on, I'm not going to sugarcoat this for you. Hey, hold it. Let's hold it down. Let's hold it down, people. The only engine we've got with enough power for a direct abort is the SPS on the service module. What Lovell has told us, it could have been damaged in an explosion, so let's consider that engine dead. We light that thing up, could blow the whole works. It's just too risky. We're not gonna take that chance. In fact, the only thing the command module is good for is re-entry, so that leaves us with dilemma, which means free return trajectory. And once we get the guys around the moon, we'll fire up the LEM engine, make a long burn, pick up some speed, and get them home as quick as we can. Gene, I I'm wondering what the, what the Grumman guys think about this. We can't make any guarantees. We designed the LEM to land on the moon. Not fire the engine out there for course correction. Well, unfortunately, we're not landing on the moon, are we? I don't care what anything was designed to do. I care about what it can do. So let's get to work. Let's lay it out, OK? I showed this uh, video many times. Uh, I showed the movie many times when uh, I was a store manager at uh, Staples. Uh, because, you know, I have new staff come in. And part of the training, I actually include this in a movie. Because it's about uh, thinking outside the box. Right? There was a problem that occurred at Apollo 13. Uh, you know, if you know the movie, problem occurred. Houston, we have a problem, that famous line. And uh, they just literally had to, like, right from the beginning of that snippet of the movie, he just said, OK, forget the flight plan. OK, that's it. It's totally not public. Like, it's beyond our plan now. We've got to think outside of this. And you realize that uh, everybody had an idea, right, of a solution, where there were two, right, prevalent ones. And uh, you notice that the solutions, well, they weren't doing it just for the sake of you know, being prideful and want to be the hero, right? Their solutions was basically within their expertise. So one side says, no, based on my expertise, I want this. This is what, how I want to do it. And another one says, no, this is my expertise, I want to do it. And then suddenly the last group was, were the gremlin guys who designed the thing. Well, it was not designed that way, so it cannot be possible. Yet Ed Harris, the guy at the front, uh, he said, no, it's time that we had to think outside. I don't care what it's designed to do. I want to care what it can do. So think outside the box. Problems, thinking outside the box. Well, guess what? We have a problem, right? In Luke, it's God's people, the Jews. They have a problem. And what was that problem? God's not here. God's not talking. He's not present. He's not present in the temple. He's not present among us. There's no prophets anymore for 400 plus years. That's a problem. And what's the solution? Well, the solution is many, actually. The Pharisees had a solution, right? Uh, we were introduced that already for the first three chapters, four actually. The Pharisees said, stick to the law. Because in the Old Testament, that's what God wanted to do. Every time they had a problem, every time they sinned and rejected God, what happens? Well, torment, right? Slavery, Egypt, Babylonians, Persians, they enslave the Israelites, right? And then when the Israelites go, are down in the dumps, what do they do? They plead to God. And then what happens when they plead to God? God sends a prophet, right? It's either Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha, Elijah, which, you know, all the shots, right? He sends a prophet or judges, right? If you read the judges. And then what happens? Well, what does the prophet say? Turn back to the Lord. Go and practice your law and decrees. Then the Lord will come back to you, right? Simple as that. Then they turn back. They go back to the law. The straight and narrow again. And then what happens? God forgives them. Back in the presence. Cloud, fire, water, famine, drought, whatever. Right? Rain starts to pour again. And things happen again. And honky-dory, life goes on until they sin again. <laughs> right? And then history repeats itself. This vicious cycle for so many years until it stopped. Right after Malachi. 
it stops. The last final prophet. Is that it? Is God, that's, like, God's not going to return again? So they have a problem. They sinned. They rebelled God. All the kings failed. The high priests are corrupt. The king out there in Herod is fake. Something's got to go, right? And, the, and God's not talking. So the Pharisees figured, solution, let's get back to our box, get into the box that we're familiar with, go back to the Old Testament, follow the law. In fact, let's create more laws to protect the law so that we won't screw up again. So let's say, like, um, uh, don't eat bacon, right? Well, don't even have pigs. How about that, right? Like, don't eat bacon, well, ban pigs, right? Don't vape. Well, ban vapes. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's a type of thing. I just brought it in. Right? But you know what I mean. They're trying to create more fences and fences and fences. And this box that they're putting themselves into, it's interesting that their walls of the boxes become thicker and thicker and thicker. Right? So to speak. These laws start to get thicker and thicker and thicker. And like last week, what did we hear? That they weren't even, uh, that the walls were so thick that people who can't even obey the law were not even allowed to go in. And those people who can't obey are those ones who are paralyzed, those ones who are sick. The Gentiles, who have no clue what the law is, can't even get in. The poor can't get in, because how can poor tithe? Right? So they cannot even get in. So it's only the wealthy that could get in. The wealthy, the healthy, the upright, the ones that look like us. We're the only ones that, like, in, back in the Old Testament, or in the first century, sorry, would be able to get into this kingdom. That's it. Everybody else who is not as opportune or uh, privileged would be able to get in. And so last week, when we had Grandpa come in, it was baffling to them to have Jesus to say, no, everybody can get in. What? No, we have these walls, for Pete's sake. Right? We don't want God to abandon us again. Right? They're, they're pretty genuine, these Pharisees. We can't knock them around like that. You know, we can't blame them for what they're doing. Then, who else would want to have solutions? The Sadducees. The Sadducees thought, no, it's all about political influence. Right? That's our solution. Let's infiltrate and influence the politics so that we could just you know, usurp them some one day and then take over the world type of thing. So political power was the Sadducees' way. Right? Then we had the priests. What was their wall? Their wall was just the temple. Stay in the temple, be happy. Don't leave the temple. Don't ever leave the temple, right? So put your children in private school, Christian private school, don't leave the temple, right? Stay yourself, keep your kids in church, keep yourselves in church, don't leave the temple. Protect yourself. Only get Christian friends. Don't associate with any other buddy else, right? That type of mentality. Those were the priests. Walls, boxes. And suddenly, what happens? Jesus happened. Jesus shows up. Chapter 1, 2, and 3, Jesus shows up and baffles the walls. Blows them up, so to speak. And how? Well, now we're into Luke chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. And let's start with verse 4. Everyone following? When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, who was also Peter, later renamed Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, dude, master, yeah. wait, hello, we've worked so hard all night and haven't caught anything, right? But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. I'm trying to emphasize the tones, but I can't. <laughs> All right. So Simon, who later will be called Peter, okay, we have this story, right? A very famous one. He was called by Jesus to let down these nets. Now, you've got to recall, uh, back then, in, uh, when you're fishing, fishermen, they usually fish at night because that's when the fish come up closer to the surface. Uh, but remember, they're not using rods, they're using nets. So the only the way to catch fish is if it's close to the surface. And because during the night, ah, forget it, the plankton, you know, they, they fish, they eat. Okay, watch Discovery Channel, you'll figure it out. All right, so 
And then, so then the, that whole night they caught nothing. You know, it was, they've already gone, it's, they've done a lot of work already. And then uh, suddenly, next, like uh, they come ashore and then they see Jesus and Jesus says, hey, I need your boat. <laughs> and then they go, uh, okay, <laughs> right? And they let us, how about you use the boat, we'll just like clean up and then do your thing and then we'll come back and then go home, right? And then after when Jesus spoke, did, uh, Jesus told Peter, now go to work. And then Peter goes, are you kidding me? I just washed up. I finally got all the stink from the fish off of my body. And you want me to go out again and fish in daylight? There's hardly any fish. Dude, what are you thinking? And then, but then Peter goes, but, okay, I've heard your talk. I've heard you speak. You sound like a guy who knows something. Maybe not fishing, but knows something else. <laughs> right? I'll give you a, I'll, 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 I'll do it just for the benefit of the doubt. Anyways, even if I don't catch anything and there's this huge crowd, it's not going to be on me. It's going to be on you. I'm not going to be embarrassed. It's you. You're the one who called me to, uh, to fish. I'm not the one who's you know, doing it. It's you. So uh, even if this whole thing goes south, it's on you anyway, Jesus. So, eh, right? So he does, right? Think about it. Like, he's so tired. These fishermen are so tired, so worn out already. And then yet Jesus wants him to do something again of the same thing. And then what happens? Well, history goes, right? He, uh, like Jesus, uh, Peter goes out there, he uh, tosses his net uh, to the left side this time, and then he catches a lot of fish, right? And then uh, we know the story from there. Principle number one, though. When I read this, I had to draw an example, and I was thinking to myself, what examples have I got been faced with when Jesus told me to do something out of the ordinary through, during my mundane life. Here's what I mean. You know, at work, I always, uh, uh, when, again, I'll use my Staples example because that's the best one. Uh, when, when I have my lunch break, right, I go to the staff lunch room, right, and then, you know, I heat up my lunch, you know, because it's leftover dinner, right, and I sit down and I stare across the table and there's three other uh, associates of mine in front of me. And then we just head down and eat and leave, right. And then I always, one time, uh, Jesus nudged me. He kind of like the Holy Spirit nudged me. And he's like, talk to them. <laughs> right? And it's like, say something. Right? And then, I'm going, and then suddenly I went, you know, me going, come on, fine. You know, like, why bother? Right? It's such a waste of time. Like, say something? What? We have only like a half an hour, Lord. Like, and I got paperwork to do up at the front. Really? Right? I'm not even balanced. I, my cashiers are not balanced. I have to write up a cashier in the later on. You know, the same one that I'm going to that you want me to talk to. <laughs> right? Like, really, do you want, like, come on, right? It's, what a waste of time. And what's going to produce? And it, so it's almost like I'm analyzing the, it to the point of paralyzing it before it even happened. Right? But then, and then, uh, uh, so then I stone. But then uh, there's also other mundane stuff uh, that, uh, he, that the Holy Spirit nudges me. Driving to my garage. Right? So I get home. Always, like, I get home, I drive to my garage, I open the garage, and then drive in and close it, right? Well, lo and behold, my neighbor does the same thing at the same time. And then I hear the Holy Spirit talk to him, right? And I'm like, why? I'm freakishly tired. I just had a long, freakishly day, right? Um, like, you know, and I'm hungry. And, I, and Jonathan, not happy, if he has low sugar levels, right? So I cannot talk. Like, and it's always a time. Sai Hela, right? Like, you know, it's just like this guy's probably going to ignore him. We just say hi and bye. So there was one time when I did, when I finally succumbed and submitted to the Holy Spirit. And I, I realized, and it was uh, something that uh, I did out of, again uh, at the garage, you know, drive up, and then I'd say, oh, there he is again. And, then, and the Holy Spirit goes, talk to him, please. And then I go, fine. <laughs> right? Since, you know what? Since uh, the food's in the slow cooker, I'm not really that in rush of it. It's already cooked. You know? <laughs> and I go over there and talk to him. And lo and behold, our conversation turned out to be a two-hour one. It was, a, it was a conversation to get to know my neighbor, but also I knew about his life. I knew that he was sick. Uh, I was able to have the opportunity to pray over him. And uh, we had a great relationship after that. And then uh, when, our, when, when uh, Rosanna and I uh, got married, our neighbor gave us those two planters. Uh, as gifts. Didn't know that, right? And then it was like life-giving. And I was floored. I was convicted. I, like, I, during that time, after that conversation, that two hours, I went to bed and I'm like, 
crud, I've missed so many opportunities, and now, like, you know, at work, at, at play, and, and now, like, just because I submitted, just, wow, Lord, I cannot believe that you could do this with something so tiny. And I believe that's what Peter was saying. When he said that, Lord, like, get out, get away from my presence, like, I'm not worthy. I think I had the same type of conviction. It's because Peter said, I'm so tired, Lord. I don't know if it's going to work out. You know, it's no point. It's kind of worthless. It's just a waste of breath. It's a waste of time. What's the point? But because of you, okay, fine. I'll just do it anyway. And suddenly this humongous fish comes out of nowhere. My fish was the neighbor. This awesome conversation that I had, the opportunity to pray over him, the opportunity to pray for healing for him, that just came out. And I, didn't, I wouldn't have known that. And I was floored. I was saying, God, wow, forgive me for I have sinned and doubted your voice. I think that's what Peter felt. And I think that's how we... And the, so the principle here today, like just the first one, is let's give it some thought of what mundane tasks that we, we are doing our day to day. Maybe having lunch with our coworkers sitting across from us. Maybe the drive up to the garage. Maybe uh, uh, the, even just the slightest of like uh, practicing uh, our well, worship here. Mondays. It's, and let's pray. Maybe the Holy Spirit is tugging us to show up, to say, do something. Say something. Say something, John. Do something out of the ordinary in your mundane. It's not going to be a waste of time. It's going to be actually amazing if you do. Okay, let's move on. Verse 12, while Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded and for, commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Now, don't harp on the, too much on the, on the Jews' customs back then. The leper, the, leper uh, the reason why he was isolated is not because they were mean to him. It's as simple as washing hands. See, today we have soap. Actually, we have food safe, right, Angela? <laughs> we, have, we have food safe. We have to be licensed. No, just kidding. Uh, like, it's just basically hygiene practices to isolate a leper so that it doesn't, so it prevents spread of disease. So the reason why the leper was isolated was because, well, it's for the, for the health of the whole community. We cannot have that. So uh, where do we find these practices of, uh, of how to approach leprosy? Well, you would find them in Leviticus chapter 13. So if you want to enlighten yourself or just have plain insomnia, just read Leviticus chapter 13 and you'll figure out how the people actually approach leprosy. But the funny thing is, the interesting thing point about Le uh, Leviticus 13 is that nowhere does it say to touch the leper. Okay, who does the healing in this in the, for a leper? Well, basically only God. Basically, they tell him go to the desert, right? Walk around, right? And uh, come back when God heals you. Um, what? And then in Le Leviticus 13 goes when God has shown mercy and grace upon this individual. Then they come. So in other words, they equate leprosy with sin. So until God forgives you and heals you, then you come back. But don't come back to us. Go to the priest, our triage, to evaluate you whether you're healed or not. Then you could join the community again. That is their healing system. You follow? But what does Jesus do here? Jesus touches the guy. Totally baffles and just blows everyone away. What are you doing? You're not supposed to touch this leper. You're going to get all his sin upon you. All his sin upon you. Okay, follow that. You're going to catch all his sin, all his filth, all his dirtiness. You're not going to be forgiven. You have to go out into the desert. You're going to get excommunicated. You got to wait until God forgives you. But then Jesus touches him. Totally baffles everybody. Because, well, here's a hint. And Luke gives us a hint. Jesus is not just any prophet. Jesus is God. And so who is doing the forgiving and the healing at the same time? God. So who is Jesus? God. But we'll get back to that soon. However, I just want to focus on the touching again. Here's the second principle I would like to 
uh, state about this outside of the box. Everybody was baffled when Jesus touched the leper, right? I was wondering, today, when we pray for anything, whether like career, or healing, or relationships, uh, or repair of relationships, right? Do we have a box for God to operate in? See, the people here had a box called healing box. No, you go to the desert and allow God to heal you. Jesus blew that up. How about us? Do we have a healing box? No, God, you heal, uh, heal me the way I want you to heal me. So you put the doctors here, you uh, incorporate a physio here, you shove some pharmacy here, maybe a witch doctor, Chinese doctor, over here, and, and, and it's, uh, so put some medicine over here, acupuncture over here, there, God, bless that. Or how about career? Here, I'm going to get my uh, degree here, I'm going to get my master's degree here, shove that over here, right? Make sure to get the professor over there, and then if you're like Annabelle, make sure I go Stanford here, get a scholarship for my basketball here, yeah. and then, and then Bless it, Lord. Right? Do we have that? Do we have those boxes that we give God to? Operate within here, because that's what I'm comfortable with, Lord. Don't go, don't, don't go beyond. Yet, here we are taught that God answers our prayers His way, His time, and He says it's perfect. We have to remember that ultimate, ultimate rule that will blow away our boxes. That God answers our prayers his time his way and it's perfect it's not within our boxes it's not how we're going to spell it out we can't spell it out to god of how he heals us how he gives us a wife or a husband how he gives us our careers he takes care of it and he'll do it in his time maybe we have our own faculties maybe like i was coaching a cpa student She's studying a, a, like a you know, CPA, right? And then so then she goes, uh, like, uh, yes, go on your faculties, right? But still submit it to God. Don't think that you have your own timing. Don't think that you're going to get married at, this, uh, at that age. And don't think that you're going to get this awesome CEO job at this time. No, it's all God. Just submit him day to day. And that's why we pray daily. We don't pray for the five-year plan, <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway. All right, let's go on to the next one. Verse 17. You guys following so far? Totally blowing up our paradigms here. One day Jesus was teaching and the and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of you, or in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home, praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. This is a very, very popular passage. Right? I'm sure you've heard it many times. So great commotion was going around when news spread about Jesus being able to heal people. Now remember, very, very few people knew who Jesus was at this moment. They didn't know that he was God. Because you know why? In the Old Testament, prophets healed as well. Elijah, Elisha, all those guys were able to heal. So really, who did they think Jesus was? Another prophet like Elijah. Remember that? Right? So they thought, oh, this is a prophet, right? And so the Pharisees were excited. That's why they came down from their hiney hiney, right? Like uh, from their temple. They came down and said, hey, I got to see this guy because he's probably a prophet. And we've been doing so well with our law. We've been getting straight A's. Let's just go to this prophet and get a pat on the back saying, you're good to go, right? That's what they wanted, really. That's why they were there. But wait, something happened, right? When they came down. Once when they came down, they saw Jesus said to this paralytic in first person, your sins are forgiven. 
The Pharisees go and says, what? You can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. How dare you? Right? And we know the process of getting forgiven sins. We know the process. It's in the Old Testament. Obey the freaking law and you'll be forgiven. Right? Jesus, the paralytic, that clearly did not obey the law of, you know, of, uh, of doing stuff because clearly he's paralytic. He can't do anything. He's, he's paralyzed. So he's not obeying the law. So how dare you forgive sins on him? He doesn't even deserve forgiveness. Right? So then uh, so the Pharisees were baffled. Why would you do that, Jesus? Who are you? Right? Then Jesus responded and gave them a question, a rhetorical one. What is easier, forgiving sins or healing? Right? Well, it's a rhetorical one because neither right, are easy. Both of them require God. Right? First of all, the healing is from God. The forgiveness is from God. So let's do our math. If it's from God and that's from God, who's Jesus? God. And they were pleased. Because once they made that the connection, they go, wait a minute. God can never be in Jesus' in human form. God is up there. He is supreme being up there. Why would any God, any God, want to become fallen like us? Why would you want to take a human form like us? No, God, you're supposed to be this awesome, immense, powerful being that will just like, tell us what we need to do, do it, and then we get forgiven, and we get mercy and grace, and we'll be in your presence. But never! would you ever come down and take upon our human nature? Because that's just so wrong. You guys follow this? This is what the Pharisees were thinking. And this is what a lot of religions out there today are thinking. Islam, do not believe that Jesus is God. They even wrote it around their temple, okay? That, that, they're saying that Jesus is not God. God can never take human form. The Jews don't believe that Jesus is God at this current day, right? That's what differentiates us from them. Jehovah Witness, Mormons do not believe that Jesus is God. Well, Mormons believe that Jesus is an alien. And Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus is some prophet. So, there you go. That's what differentiates us as Christians compared to the other religions. Is that we believe that Jesus is God. Now, if Jesus is God, then, how are we expecting Jesus to behave? Do we expect God to behave in a way that Jesus is behaving? Feeding the poor feeding the hungry, healing the sick. Because if that is the God that we're worshiping, if he is the God that we're worshiping, then what should we be doing? What should we be doing? So this totally blows the minds of everyone, especially the Pharisees, especially the Jews who were holding so hard on the law, right? That, wait a minute, it's not about the law then? Yikes. Think about it. That's her, their whole career just went upside down. Okay, let's move on. Verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw that tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. You notice that where Levi is? He's sitting at the tax booth. And where did we just come from? The fisherman, right? It's interesting, eh? It's like, a, you know, he's always uh, around, snooping around, trying to get money from the business people who are coming in anyway. He's like the tariff guy. Right? Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their seat, a sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Now you know where that's coming from. Jesus answered them, It is not healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Verse 36. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise... They will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured out into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. Tax collectors were awful people in that day. Rome wanted to collect taxes, and who did they get? They're very sneaky and very strategic. They get Jews. They get Jews to collect from Jews. That's horrible, right? You would think that they would get a Roman, you know, like at least a foreigner to collect it, but they got the fellow peers to go against each other. That creates division, and when you're divided, you're conquered, right? 
Remember that old uh, thing? So basically, they got these Jews to become tax collectors. Levi was a Jew. And then what else is that in order for Levi to make a living, he had to collect extra on top of it, sort of like commission, right? So uh, let's say I collect from Vivian 20 bucks to go to Caesar. Well, I won't tell her that I need $20 from her. I tell her, tell her I need 50 from you because I, <laughs> I'm going to pocket 30. But then Vivian goes, oh, you know that I'm, that I'm lying to you, but then you, can, you don't have no choice because if you don't obey me, you'll be thrown into the lion's den and you'll be eaten alive. And there goes Vivian. Right? So therefore, there's no, she can't do anything about it, right? But she knows that I'm cheating her. And then she's wondering, you're a Jew, you're a fellow sis, brother or sister in the church, how could you possibly cheat on me, <laughs> right? So anyways, this is what's going on. These tax collectors are sinning. Now, how are they sinning though? Look at the Pharisees' definition of sin. Their definition is to, about the law, right? And we know that in the, in the law of Moses, you can't cheat people money. You're not allowed. So for the Pharisees, a sinner is basically a person that is not obeying the law. That's sinner. You follow? But what does Jesus say? He redefines what sin is. What does he say? Everyone's a sinner. Everyone. No matter how well you obey the law, you're a sinner. Right? The only way that you'll be healed is if you admit that you are sick. That if you admit that you are a sinner and that's what we do at baptism right when we go to baptism what do we do we don't testify about how good we feel we testify about how bad we are and that's why we come to repentance is because we're sick and we need to be healed and we need a doctor and that doctor is jesus which is baffling because the pharisees wanted perfection wanted law you obey the law you're not a sinner how many of us feel the same way like the pharisee then Maybe. Hey, I'm a law-abiding citizen. I pay my taxes. I go to church every Sunday. I read the Bible. I go to Bible study sometimes, maybe regularly. I, I have well-behaved kids. We all go to Christian schools. And we have all friends that are Christian. Yes, and also, we don't go, go with soji. We are anti-soji. We're anti-gay, anti-homosexual, whatever. Right? We anti-everything. I saw a teacher that said anti-everything actually once. And, and so we're all good, right? I'm not sick. I'm not a sinner. I don't I need healing. It's those people, the dirty people out there that need that needs healing. It's those ones that need sinning, right? I'm very humble. I'm very good, right? I'm done. I got my ticket to heaven. Don't bother me, Jesus. It's those people, right? To the left, <laughs> right? So that's what the Pharisees were thinking. But Jesus says, nah, -uh. everyone's sick. And until you admit that you're sick, you cannot be healed. And, that you, and I have nothing to do with you. Until you realize, we all realize that we are sick at this moment, today, sitting here, as long as, like, we need to admit to ourselves that we are still sick. That we still need healing. That we still need to come to the presence of Jesus, ask for his grace and mercy and forgiveness and repent of our sin. Because for Pete's sake, we're all freakishly selfish when we got here. Somewhere down the line, we were selfish. We had a selfish thought when we got here. We're all sick, and we all need Jesus. And so the Pharisees go, this can't be. And you're, you're allowing a tax collector who admits that he's sick, and you, you allow him in, but you don't allow us in? That's not right. It's baffling. It blows up their wall. Jesus claims that, he, that his claims of being God, certainly if you are God, you shouldn't be dining with sinners. You should be dining with perfect people. You should be dining with the people who are law-abiding, who go to church regularly, who swears by your name regularly, who prays regularly, who obeys the law regularly, and, and just be perfect. Why are you dining with those who ask for forgiveness? Why are you dining with those who say that they're sick and plead for your mercy? Just leave them. That's what the Pharisees were saying. Folks, this is very humbling for all of us, isn't it? How many of us say that, no, you, like, uh, we can't associate with them because it might make us dirty. We can't associate with these folks because, uh, and then we misread this passage about bad company corrupts character, right? No, let's not do that. That's a total misread. No, Jesus wants to save. His intent is to save everyone. And he just, and he just that desire is for all of us to say that we need you. Okay, let's conclude. So how about us? 
are we operating within our boxes? First of all, for the, remember the first principle. Are we like the fishermen? Maybe uh, Jesus' first disciples, maybe we are like that. You know, hearing God tugging us to do something out of the ordinary in our mundane, you know, like, you know, Vivian, like, like let's say that you were opening your store and suddenly your coworkers come in, you know, same old dilly dally, get your cash register out, get the balance going, and then shove it in, and then after when work is done, go home, <laughs> right? And then suddenly the Holy Spirit talks you, going, talk to her, right? There's something going on with her, talk to her. Are we like those? Are we like the disciples who says, you know, ah, <laughs> right? It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to be uh, taking a lot of energy. Home off on, right? Or are we like those people that were watching the leper being healed? Do we have a paradigm for that? Take a look at our prayers. Have we ever listened to our prayers? Maybe we're putting the God in a box with our prayers. Lord, uh, keep Annabel safe. Don't let her to hang out with bad girls. I don't want to see her come home with a tattoo one day. You know, nose ring, whatever, right? Those are my nightmares. I must admit, I need to repent too. Um, you know, so those type of things, right? Come on, Brian. Like, you don't want to like, like Marcus to bring in like a biker girl. Like, jeez. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, so those type of things, right? Like, are we putting God in that box, right? That's simple, simple as that. And I must admit, see, I am sick in that way. You think that is an honorary prayer, but it's not. It's actually putting God in a box of how he could work in my daughter, how he could work in his son. We're putting the God in a box too. We're sinning, actually, by definition. So are we like that, like the leper, like, uh, like the people observing the leper? Or are we like the Pharisee? Are we like the Pharisee? We keep the law to the T. We, run, we walk to the straight and narrow. And if we ever see a friend who commits, I don't know, who sleeps before marriage, or, or somebody who comes out of the closet, which has happened in my life, uh, like a, somebody, my, one of my friends comes out of the closet and says that he's gay, will I suddenly say, you're a sinner, out you go, right? I don't want to associate with you. Are we like those? Oh, I'm not going to hang out with this guy. Or I'm not going to hang out with this girl. Or whatever, I'm not going to talk to these people. I'm going to stick with my circles. Pharisees. Or are we going to be, and we're going to come to it, Levi? Are we going to be like the tax collector who says, and you know what, that's it. I'm done. Jesus has this new wine that he has offered. I'm going to get out of my box. He actually did. He got off his box. I'm going to get out of my box. Forget about how people love to see me. Forget about the law, uh, how the law sees me. I know I'm a sinner, and I have sinned deeply. I'm going to come to Jesus open-handed, blow up my boxes, and allow the new wine to come in. Allow his new life to enter into me continually. Continually to fill me with new wine so that I am made new. Maybe it's time for all of us to reevaluate ourselves, especially what I just said. Are we the fishermen? Are we the Pharisee? Are we the observers of the leper? Right? Maybe we do have boxes that putting God into boxes. Maybe our lives are within boxes. Maybe it's time to blow up our boxes and allow this new wine, the new life that Jesus has offered to enter into us. Because he did say, our boxes cannot contain this new wine. Our boxes cannot contain this new life that Jesus offers us. There's a reason why some of us may not, ever, may not feel the presence of God in us. Quite possibly, it's because our boxes are too thick. The walls of our boxes are too thick. 